Okay, so here's our agenda for the next 45 minutes. Um, a quick overview about some development alternatives. You know, we're, we're trying to create a stream we can play on multiple platforms. Uh, there are multiple development alternatives for doing that. Let's examine those before we get started. Um, we'll jump into a, an overview of, of H.264. That's the codec you have to use for to distribute to multiple streams today. Just a couple of compatibility-related items you need to know about H.264 to get that done, and we'll cover that. Um, spend a little bit of time on adaptive bitrate streaming. Presumably, most people here are going to want to use adaptive bitrate to reach their target customers. Um, we'll look at some of the adaptive bitrate alternatives, and then we'll look at configuring your adaptive bitrate streams. So the premise of the talk is to maximize your revenue, you want to distribute your video on all available streams. So you want to, you want to distribute it to computers, both Windows and Macintosh. Um, mobile devices, iOS, Android, and maybe some others, and also OTT devices, and even beyond that, you want to distribute to smart TVs. Basically, anywhere they can watch video from IP delivery, you want to get your streams there. And just a couple of caveats. This is a, it's a very complex, dynamic subject. You know, what I say today won't be true tomorrow. What I researched last week may not be true today. So. You know, I make mistakes too, bear with me. If you see anything that's wrong, just let me know and we can talk about it. I'm also an encoding person, not a programmer. So I mean, I can talk about what you have to do to create an app at a high level, but I've never created an app myself. So there may be some knowledge gaps there. And a lot of these topics are very uh, emotional for people. The whole flash is bad, HTML5 is good. So, you know, I'm just kind of, sharing my viewpoints. I'm not really trying to rain on anybody's parade or criticize anybody. But you know, we'll go through that as we go through the, uh, as we go through the discussion. So when I talk about development approaches, you know, what are the ways you can get your video onto a computer? So if you want your video to play on a computer, what can you do? Number one is you can send it in a way where the browser will play it back. So you send an HTML5 video to a browser, as long as you put the video tag in above the, the video file, the video will play in the browser and you don't have to spend any money at all. Right? So it's very simple, very easy. Um, the only problem is HTML5 today is about 70 to 90% penetration, depending on who you look at. So any single file delivery technique, depending totally on HTML5, is not going to distribute to 10 to 15% of available viewers. So presumably that's enough that you don't really want to ignore. Um, plugins are next. You know, when I say Flash is good, I mean Flash is good because it's the only plugin that's on 95% plus desktop and and uh, and, uh, and notebooks. So if you distribute your video via Flash, it doesn't cost you anything. You don't have to create an app. You don't have to create an application. You don't have to do anything. You just have to make sure it plays in the Flash player. And then you play on between 95 to 98% of computers and notebook computers. Um, an off-the-shelf player you know, is a player like the JW player, very easy to implement, gives you some additional capabilities that we'll look at when we look at uh, adaptive streaming. And the cost is very, very moderate. It's $300 for the JW player, and that gives you some capabilities that you can't get in the browser or plugin. So all those, all those options are very easy and very inexpensive, but you can also create your own custom player. So you may have heard a lot about um, YouTube using Dash. So YouTube uses Dash to deliver some streams to some browsers on some computers. What does YouTube have that we probably don't have? You know, billions to spend on player development. So if you want to develop your own player, implement Dash, you can do that. I'm not saying you can't use Dash on the desktop, but you're going to spend a whole lot more to do that than you would if you depend upon the browser, the plugin, or the off-the-shelf player. So the easiest way to send video to a, to a desktop would be to use Flash. 95 to 98% penetration, you know, life is good. That doesn't mean you can't use Dash, but if you want to use Dash, you've got to spend a lot of money on player development. Uh, 
that's a great question. I mean, the, the problem, you mean this, this here? I mean, Flash, I think, is, is everywhere. You know, I think Flash is, the, they stopped publishing numbers because uh, it was no longer strategic for them. But the last numbers that were published were in the 95 to 98%. Every major broadcaster in the US, and you know, I haven't checked in, in, in Europe, depends on Flash for playback, so at least on desktops. So I'm guessing Flash penetration is, is usually high. On the HTML5 side, there's a lot of older computers and corporations that may be running um, uh, XP and may not have updated to the latest browsers. There's four or five different services that give these numbers, and the lowest is in the 70% range. You know, that's the, that's the lowest percentage of HTML5 browser. The highest is in the 90% range. I would presume in the corporate environment, it's probably closer to the 70 than to the 90. And also education and also government. Because those are the, you know, they have locked down desktops where people can upgrade just because they want to, and they have the oldest computers. Okay, in the mobile space, you have the same kind of dichotomy. Life is really easy if you can use a technology that plays natively in the browser. You don't have to spend any money. If you send in, we'll talk about what HTTP live streaming is in a few minutes. It's, a, it's Apple's adaptive bitrate technology. If you send an HLS stream to an iPhone, it's going to play. It doesn't cost you anything. On the other hand, if you want to play Flash or Dash or smooth streaming on an iOS device, you can do that, but you have to create an app. An app involves both development costs and it involves distribution expense and also penetration, right? Because not everybody you want to distribute the app or to use the app is going to get the app. So again, Browser is easiest because it plays natively, but you can pretty much use any technology you want if you want to build an app. It costs you more, you have penetration issues. And then when I think about multiple screen delivery, this is kind of the paradigm that I use. I start, you know, computers, love them or hate them, you know, everybody's ignored them for years, but they still are the largest installed base of viewing devices for video. Next time up that is mobile, and then retail OTT, I mean Roku, Apple TV, devices like that. Beyond that are the smart TVs, and beyond that are the, the OEM OTT, a lot of the custom channels that are going in. And what's interesting about this dynamic is when you go up the pyramid, the numbers of viewers decrease, and the cost to reach them increases. So that means the cost per viewer gets much, much higher. Why is it that only Netflix and Hulu and other paid subscriptions are serving people in this class? Because it costs a lot of money to serve people in that class. And unless you're getting subscription revenue or huge advertising revenue, it doesn't make sense to even try it. So if you, you know, I work with consultants who provide multiple screen capabilities to a lot of their, you know, bread and butter clients. And probably 85 to 95% only care about these two categories. Why? Because it's, you know, you can spend $5,000 for an approach and you can have a pretty effective solution. Once you start to go above this, your costs increase dramatically, which is why, you know, it's, it's typically the YouTubes and all the other companies I mentioned that are supporting them, not the, the mom and pop, um, you know, website. So rule number one, you know, if you're thinking about multiple screen delivery, today the only codec you can use is H.264, very high quality compression technology, um, plays pretty much anywhere. It plays in Flash, QuickTime, and Silverlight. It plays in HTML5 and Chrome, IE and Safari, but not Firefox and Opera. So if you want, if you have an HTML5 based strategy um, and, you want to, and you want to support Firefox and Opera, you can either fall back to Flash, we'll, we'll see what that looks like in a minute, or you can send them WebM files, which are compatible and playback in HTML5. So kind of a pain in the butt if you're looking at HTML5 support. H.264 plays natively on all mobile devices. If you send an H.264 file to Android, to Windows, to uh, iOS, it will play without any problem. And they also play on OTT platforms without any problems as well. So H.264 is the it codec if you want multiple screen delivery. 
but it, it doesn't give you all the HTML5 platforms. Uh, it, it's browser dependent. Okay, so there's, you know, we could, we could spend three hours on using H.264, but from a compatibility perspective, you know, where the files will play, where they won't play, the number one configuration option you need to be aware of is the concept of the, um, the profile. So when you encode H.264 video, pretty much every encoding tool gives you the ability to set the profile, and this profile will determine where this file will play. So if you choose the high profile and you try and play that on a, an iPhone 3, it's not going to play. So whenever you produce H.264 for multiple delivery, you need to know what profile am I using. 98% of the problems relate to older mobile devices. All computers can play any profile. All OTT boxes can play any profile. But if you want older mobile devices, you really have to be concerned with using the baseline or the main profile. So what are profiles? Kind of an interesting chart. Profiles are sets of encoding tools or algorithms you can use to create a bit stream. So these are the encoding tools and algorithms here. And then these are the ones you can and can't use in the various profiles. So what assumption would you make about the high profile regarding the quality of the output compared from here to here? Which would be higher quality? Anybody, what would our guess be? I know it's after lunch. I know we had a bunch. Pardon? High profile. Why? Because they use all these advanced techniques. What would you think the downside of the high profile might be? Encoding gets more complex, takes more time. Encoding takes more time. And what about on the playback side? Decoding takes more time. It's either more time or more CPU horsepower. So that, so looking at this chart, you would say, Higher quality stream, longer to encode, more CPU to decode. Lower quality stream, easier to encode, easier to decode. And we'll look at, we'll examine that assumption in, in, a, in a moment. And why do profiles exist? Because it's a convenient way for people to implement H.264 on low power devices. So Apple came out with the original video capable iPod. We don't want to put a chip in here that can play the high profile, too expensive, uses too much power, too hot. We'll put in a lower power chip, plays the baseline profile, and anybody who wants to produce video that plays on this device needs to know to encode it using the baseline profile. Okay, so it's a convenient meeting point between hardware developers and video producers. And rule number two, so rule number one is use H.264. Rule number two is don't exceed the profile of the target device. And again, only a problem in mobile, not a problem on OTT or computers. Okay, so this is a chart that, ac that accumulates most of the playback requirements of Apple devices. Apple does two things. You know, number one, they have a very limited set of products. Number two, they document them very well. So it's very simple to create a chart like this. And you know, these products aren't connected, so they're typically not a consideration. Um, iPhones through version 4 only play baseline profile up to 2.5 megabits per second. So if you care about these phones, you need to encode using the baseline profile. iPhone 4 to the iPhone 4S plays main and then high, and then if you're, if you're distributing to iPads, they play either main or high. So whenever you produce video and you're concerned about reaching different iOS devices, this is what you need to, you need to go back to the start and say, do we care about this class? You know, do we care about the people in the purple? Yes, no. If we do, we got to use the baseline profile. Do we care about the people in blue? Yes, no. If we do, we need to use the main profile. And then here's the deal for Android. And then you see the URL for this chart. This chart changes, you know, occasionally. So if you come back in six months, you want to you go back to the original URL. What the problem with Android is there's multiple vendors, and the vendors do a really terrible job documenting the capabilities of their phones. So we have all the Apple devices on one chart. We can't do that with Android devices. So what Google does is say, we know that on any modern phone, they will all play back the SD configuration and this configuration 
And we think they'll play this, but we're not sure. So if your boss says, I want to encode a stream that will play on all Android devices, you can, you can go one in two directions. You can say, well, look at this chart. They all play this. So if we want to be really sure it's going to play, we need to use this configuration. Or you can say, realistically, they're all as powerful as iOS devices, so they probably say, you know, play the same profiles as iOS devices, and we can use that chart as guidance. And I think most, some producers use only baseline profile for Android because they really want, you know, if you're going to approach Android, you need to, you know, you may want to use the profile that is guaranteed for playback. But that, that is a very much lower quality stream. Anybody care about Windows phones? Me either. Um, so the big, decision, the big decision you have is, you know, we think back to that chart that showed the profiles. We have all those lovely encoding algorithms on one side. You can use them in the high profile, but you can't use them in the baseline profile. So if you're producing, and again, your boss says, I'm with the highest possible quality file for every device we play on, and you say, well, you know, we got to use the baseline profile for these older Apple devices, and then the question is, well, do you want to create two sets of streams, one using the baseline profile for older devices and one using the high profile for computers and OTT? So that's, that's the big question facing a lot of developers. And it really cuts to the heart of, you know, do you get better quality if you use the high profile in these configurations? So this is... This is a chart from Apple's TN2224, which is their tech note on producing for streaming. And these are the recommended adaptive bitrate files they say you should, you should create. And at the low end, targeting cellular, they want you to use the baseline profile here. Why do they want you to use the baseline profile? Because they play back on those older phones. And then here, they say you can use the main profile because they play back on the next class of devices. And here they recommend using the high profile because that'll play back on Apple TV, the newest iPads, and the newest iPhones. So this is what Apple says you should do. Very popular document for people producing for adaptive streaming. So what I wanted to do was, again, how much quality difference between files encoded using the baseline profile and files encoded using the high profile? And again, the key point is, do I need to create two sets of streams one for OTT and computers using the high profile, or can I use one set of streams for both? Why would you want to use one set of streams for both? Lower encoding costs, lower storage costs, lower administration costs. So this is one reason you may want to download the handout. Again, it's on my website, streaminglearningcenter.com. What I did was I looked at these three configurations here, here, and here, and I, I encoded using the high profile, I encoded using the baseline profile, and we're going to look at the frame comparisons. So the high profile is on top, the baseline profile is on the bottom, and I really expected to see dramatic quality differences, and I see very little here. The next is 480 by 270. I see very little difference here. And the next is 640 by 360, and I see very little difference here. So from my perspective, I think you can get away with one adaptive group using baseline at the lower end, main in the middle, and high at the upper end. It doesn't make sense to, to, um, to produce two. On the other hand, you know, most of the big television broadcasters that I work with customize streams for each target. So they'll create 24 streams. You know, eight are going to mobile, eight are going to, eight are going to desktop, and eight are going to OTT, and they're all slightly different. But the, I think the most economical approach is to create one set of streams, and then we'll talk about what transmuxing is in a few minutes, and serve them to all your, all your targets. The key takeaway is don't expect there to be a lot of difference between the baseline and the high profile. Just because it looks good on the chart doesn't mean you're going to have a huge difference when you actually implement the codec um, with, your, with your files. And then just a word on levels. You know, if we look back at this chart here, we see that there are levels in this definition, and levels are just additional limiting parameters on 
resolution, data rate, items like that. Levels only matter with mobile devices. They don't matter at all with computers or OTT boxes. They can play any profile, any level. So if you're delivering the mobile, you need to make sure that the levels that you use when you encode don't exceed that supported by the target device. Okay, so that's the background. And let's look at the easy way to support mobile devices and computers with a single file using HTML5. Okay, so you can reach all mobile devices, all computers, pretty much for free if you use a program called Handbrake to create your, your H.264 files, and if you can create your own flash fallback code, and it's very, very simple to do. So if your boss says, how do we reach computers and mobiles in a very easy, fast way? Think HTML5 with flash fallback. So why do we want flash fallback? Again, because you know, 10 to 15% of browsers out there are not HTML5 compatible, probably much lower in the spaces we talked about before, the corporate education and government spaces. So what flash fallback does is it plays, you know, it presents a schema where the browser can say, okay, do you play H.264? And the browser says, no, I don't. It says, well, do you play WebM? The browser says, no, I don't. And if all else fails, it falls back to Flash. So that's what Flash fallback is. And it gives you, on a computer, this makes sure that you reach 98% of the browsers out there instead of just those that play, you know, that are HTML5 compatible. And all of the mobile platforms, all the smartphones, will just play the H.264 file. Okay, so to, to use this schema, all you need to do is encode your file using H.264 and then create this code. And if, you know, any, any person who knows HTML should be able to produce that. If you want to use the third-party tool to produce it, you can use Sorensen Squeeze. Um, so what Sorensen Squeeze can do is it can produce the, you put one file in, it will encode to H.264, encode to WebM, and create this HTML code for you. Very simple solution if you're not, a, you know, if you're not um, comfortable to doing it yourself. There's a tutorial on the streaming media website at this URL if you want to see what that looks like. Now, what's the problem with HTML5? You don't get true streaming. You get progressive playback. That's more inefficient from a, from a distribution perspective. Um, you don't get adaptive delivery. You don't get captions. You don't get DRM. And you only get the bottom two tiers, right? So you're not going to get the top of the pyramid if you use this solution. OK, so now let's turn our attention to solutions that allow us to use adaptive streaming. So what is adaptive streaming? It's a single stream in, whether it's live or on demand. There are multiple outputs created, and then the distribution server sends the appropriate stream to the target playback device. So if you're playing it on a mobile platform, you get the lowest quality stream. If you're playing it on your living room connected computer, you get the highest possible quality stream. Adaptive streaming is the best way to deliver because you can send you know, a, a very good quality stream here at a low bit rate and deliver to your mobile viewers. But if somebody is connected on a very, very fast uh, connection and has a very powerful computer, they get a great experience. And you can't do that with a single file. OK, so when I talked about religion before, this is kind of one of the areas where religion comes into play. There's multiple technologies for doing this. There are server-based technologies. The, the most popular until a couple of three years ago was uh, RTMP Flash Dynamic Streaming. And maybe even starting four or five years ago, HTTP-based technology started becoming much more popular. 
HTTP live streaming is Apple's schema. Um, the only way to send adaptively to iOS devices. Smooth streaming was Microsoft's for Silverlight. HTTP-based dynamic streaming, or HDS, is Adobe's response. Hey, we can do HTTP too. And then dynamic adaptive streaming over HTTP is the DASH standard that we've all heard a lot of talk about. So we could, we could literally spend 45 minutes to an hour talking about which of these is best. But from my perspective, the one that's best is the one that's easiest to implement and cheapest to implement. So here are the different target platforms that we want to reach. And these are the different ways we can reach them. So if we decided we want to use Flash with RTMP, we can use that on the desktop with just the Flash player. It's green because it's very easy. On the other hand, I've got to create an app for iOS, an app for Android, an app for WinPhone, and an app for retail OTT. Apps are bad. They cost a lot of money. That's why they're in red. So that's kind of the schema I used here. And if you look at the schema that's got the least red, it's HLS. And none of us care about Windows Phone anyway. So if you look at uh, smooth streaming, it'll play back on the desktop if you create a, either a, a Flash plugin or Silverlight. But it's a custom app for the various other platforms we want to reach. Flash HDS is the same as Flash RTMP. Dash is custom development all the way around. So it's doable, but you spend a lot of money. So I think this is, the, this is the best solution for smaller producers because it's the one that's easiest to implement. And that's what we're going to, that's what we're going to look at. A couple of points down here. Um, Apple has not been very friendly to Dash applications to date. So it's unclear whether or not they would approve an app if it uses Dash. Why would they be kind of pissy about that? Because they, wanna, they want to um, control the experience. And they know how to control the experience with HLS. They may not know how to control it with Dash. So I don't think they're being sinister. I think they're, they, they like to know what's going on in their, in their platform. And I should say that Android 4.4, which is around 8.5%, supports Dash natively. So it's 92% you know, of this category you'll have to create an app for, but a growing segment of this as the years go on will support, will support Dash natively. Any questions about this? Kind of a big concept. All I'm saying is all the technologies have their pluses and minuses, but this one is the easiest to implement because, it, because you've got iOS natively, and you can get this with an off-the-shelf player that costs $300. Does that make sense? OK, so good question. Um, Android is supposed to support HLS from version 3.0 on. It supported HLS, but it supported it poorly. So they had scaling issues, aspect ratio issues. You couldn't turn the phone and have the, the video respond. So a lot of people didn't do that. What they did was they just send a single MP4 stream to Android because they know that will play using essentially HTML5. So you can. You can support it natively, and this is supposed to be orange. You know, native is you know, a concern because it, it doesn't play it very well. Or you can create an app, or you can fall back to a single MP4 file. You don't get adaptive streaming, but you get a file that will play well under all the, under all the, the conditions. And we'll, we'll look at that in a second um, with the JW player. So the JW player is an off-the-shelf player. What does off-the-shelf player mean? It's, it's a Flash player. HTML5 player that's very easy to implement. You, know, you can create your own Flash player using the, you know, a bunch of different ways, but you can, you can embed the JW player into your website very, very simply, very, very easily. A lot of, you know, JW player is the most widely used um, off-the-shelf player. And what's, what's cool about the, the, uh, the JW player is it will give you the ability to play HLS files on the desktop. OK, so if you just want to create one set of adaptive streaming files for HLS, you can use the JW player to play those on any computer that has Flash installed. So all of a sudden, by just creating a single set of, H of uh, HLS files, you've got the ability to, use the to reach these computers using the JW player to reach mobile 
you know, the iOS can play it natively, the JW player will fall back to a single MP4 file if, if it won't play the, the, uh, the HLS streams, and all retail OTT, whether it's Roku or Apple TV or Chromecast, play HLS natively. So you create one set of files and you get this group of target customers. And the total cost is, you know, you can create HLS compatible files with compressor. And there's a, you know, there, you can do it with squeeze, cost 500 bucks cross platform. And then you need to license the JW player, which costs you $300. So for under $1,000, you can support those three major categories on the, on the total playback platform. No. No, 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 no. Flash, so Flash plays H.264. So if you, you create the set of H, you create the set of HLS files, they will play back on computers as long as Flash is installed. Why do they need Flash? To get the H.264 playback. So H, you, need a, you, need a, you need a codec player to play back every file, right? So H.264 decode has to be installed on every computer. They use Flash for that because they didn't, they didn't want to license it separately. Did that answer your question? Okay. I mean, there's, I'll show you a couple of resources you can. Come after the, I'll show you a couple of resources after the class. Because I've done a couple of tutorials. I did a webinar on this. So there's some really good resources out there if you're interested in how to encode for HLS, how to use the JW player to reach, to reach these categories of, um, of users. So what, what don't you get with, um, with this approach? You don't get the tippy top tiers. And you know, if you're a subscription-based service and those represent significant revenue, that's a big issue. Um, if you're, again, a pretty bread and butter site, you just want inexpensive reach, the cost per user is too high for, for your monetization model, then this could be a really, really good solution. And you also don't get the ability to customize a group of streams for each target. So again, a lot of the big broadcasters, and this is, um, this is Turner Broadcasting. This is what they put together for League Pass, which is a subscription service that they have in the States. So this is one group of streams targeted for computers. This is another group of streams targeted for mobile. And this is another group of streams targeted to OTT. So this is their schema. And as I said, most of the big producers are using separate streams for the different targets. Most of the smaller producers are doing one set, kind of like what Apple recommends with that TN, that tech note we looked at, and then using those for, for, to deliver to all, um, to all targets. So we leave, you know, in the adaptive streaming space, we looked at this approach, which is use HLS with an off-the-shelf player. We looked at this approach, which was to create custom encoding groups. And the third approach is to create a single set of profiles in Transmux. Okay, so this is where you, you create one set of files using Flash RTMP, deliver Flash on the desktop, convert that to HLS for, deliver to for delivery to mobile. Um, what is Transmux saying? Transmuxing is one set of files in. It's kind of what you see here. It can be live, can be on demand. And then the server can format that for delivery to multiple devices. So you create your one set of files in, say, MP4 file format. You feed it into your distribution server. And this could be the Adobe Media Server. This can be Wowza Streaming Engine. This can be the Helix Engine and it will create the files necessary to support all of your disparate targets. Okay, what don't I like about this approach? It's much more complex, and this is gonna be more expensive than what you need to do for the JW player. But most of the medium-sized companies are probably using this approach. Transmuxing is a very, very popular approach. Um, and it, more on transmuxing, you know, you're, Again, you start out with a single MP4 file or group of MP4 files, and then you, you don't re-encode it. You just change the container format, 
and create the necessary manifest files to support the different target market. Very lightweight. You can do it in real time, very low latency. So it's a very, very, very cool operation. Who can do it? Most of the major media servers at this time can do it. So Adobe can do it. Real Networks can do it. Wowza invented it. They still do it. Cloud services like the Azure Media Services do it. Content delivery networks like Akamai can do it. And a lot of service providers like iStream Planet do this as part of their integrated service. So transmuxing is a very, very popular operation for taking in one set of files and supporting multiple targets with that set of files. If you, if you are going to transmux, that means you have to have one set of files that serves all your multiple targets, right? You know, because you can't trans, you can either create separate groups for computers, mobile, and OTT, like we saw what, what Turner did with their NBA pass, or you create one set of files and transmux. And I think that's the best approach because I don't, I don't think there's any real quality difference between the main and the, and the high end baseline profile like we saw before. Okay, and then there's Dash. Then how do we get to the very, very tippy top of the platform? And that's where Dash comes in. So, you know, what's holding Dash up? The lack of general purpose support in the, in, in the largest markets. So Adobe isn't supporting Dash in Flash, so you can't use that yet. It's not fully supported in all the HTML5 browsers, so you can't use Dash via HTML5. It's, it's only in one segment of Android devices, about 10% of devices, and it's not an IS at all. So in terms of reaching the bottom of the market, Dash is just nowhere from all the easy ways we looked at. Is it in the browser? No. Is it in a plugin? No. Is it native? No. So you can do Dash from the, from the bottom to the top, but your development costs are very, very high because you've got to create apps for every platform and a custom player for computers and desktops. And that's what's slowing Dash up. And what's interesting is how HLS became the IT distribution technology. And that's because Apple was so popular that there was so much content created in this format that all of a sudden everybody needed to support it. So Android said, well, Flash is gone. When Adobe said we're not supporting Flash on Android anymore, what are we going to do? They said, well, let's use it, HLS. Great decision. They, they, you know, they, they mucked it up by doing it poorly, but it was a good technology decision. All the CDNs, their customers were saying, how do I serve multiple platforms? They said, well, we'll transmux from RTMP to HLS. So they're in CDNs. You're uh, an, over the, you know, an OTT player. What format are you going to support? You're going to support HLS because there's so much content out there. So Apple started this, and then the support for HLS grew that it became almost universal in the, in the streaming infrastructure. And, and I think the bottom line is, you know, Dash is going to have to be forced on Apple. Apple's not going to, Apple's got tremendous leverage by owning the technology that everybody is using. So what's going to have to happen is that all of these companies start to use Dash so that the, the only island left is going to be the Apple devices and then, you know, less and less content will be produced in HLS. I think we're very far from this, but this is the dynamic that people are predicting will occur. You know, today, YouTube uses Dash on some, some browsers, on some platforms. Netflix uses Dash. Um, a lot of the other, you know, Hulu's using Dash. So a lot of that's coming, but HLS is still the, the easiest technology to use in the lower three quadrants of products. So again, if you, um, if you want to reach the entire pyramid, Dash or some combination of Dash and the other technologies is the only way to do it. And then, you know, how is this playing out in the space as I see it? You know, I think the easiest solution for smaller websites, they just want to get their video to play on 
desktops and mobile. I think HTML5 is a great solution. Single file, obviously all the negatives of a single file solution. No DRM, no captioning. So it's low featured, but most of those sites don't care about that anyway. If you want adaptive streaming, I think this is a great approach in the mid-range. I think above here, you're seeing Flash and HLS delivery with transmuxing um, or just separate streams. And I think the, the really, really big companies with huge development budgets and the revenue to support those, you know, those are the people who are implementing Dash in the short term. And until we see Dash in all the HTML5 browsers, Dash in Android, Dash in HLS, it's not going to be a practical solution down here unless you've got a really big development budget to support it. No. How did that happen? Was it an accident or was it by design? So does Apple get any revenue from HLS usage? No. Was that by design? I think so. I mean, they submitted it to the IETF, Internet Engineer Task Force, something like that, as, a, as an open standard. And I think their interest was... It's almost like we talked about with profiles in H.264. They just wanted a convenient, well-supported technology that people could use to get video onto iPods. And I think the benefit to them is that if you like video, today, even today, Apple is the preferred platform. So I think they've created the best platform for mobile viewing, and I think they'd rather make that available to everybody and sell more iDevices than they would try to license it and just get into that whole revenue stream uh, complication. Anybody else? You mentioned the media, the browser and other media servers doing transmasking, right? Say it again. You mentioned the media servers doing transmasking. Correct. So can the job done by all online video platforms be summarized in this one word as well, transmasking? Can the job done by all online video platforms be defined as transmasking? You also mentioned ice cream planets, so that's... I think a lot of them are using transmasking because it's much more efficient than much more efficient than creating multiple sets of files and storing those. But I, I don't want to say it's used exclusively. But I think that's the direction. And there are a lot of services, you know, where if you, if you, if you go under the hood, you'll see the Wowza media server and the Wowza transcoder. So it's a very popular pro, not just with small companies, but with very big companies as well. Anybody else? OK, thanks for your attention. Oop. So do we know how long it will take until the major browsers support Dash? I think Chrome is very close, or, you know, so the media source extensions, I think it's support for that. So I think Chrome has it, IE has it. Um, Firefox is along the way, don't know about Safari. And that's the problem with the HTML5 approach. I mean, with Flash, love it or hate it, if it didn't work, you could point a finger at Adobe. But, you know, with, with HTML5, until it's, pervasively supported equally on all browsers, it's, almost, it's, it's not worth it. Because, you know, I use Firefox, and until, you know, until Firefox does Dash as well as Chrome, then, you know, it's not a good solution for people who want to reach those users. Nobody wants to change browsers to watch a video. So, and that's why HTML5 video has such a low level of capabilities, because they all decided they could meet simple playback in a window, and beyond that, they just, they just didn't agree. They couldn't even agree on the codec. Okay, thanks for your attention.